God is good all the time. Let's dismiss the children and the youth to Children's Church. You may be dismissed. The children are right around the corner here and uh, in the courtyard, and the youth will be right over in the youth center. So you are dismissed. Hey, good morning. Can you guys, uh, you guys alive? Good to worship the Lord this morning, isn't it? Man, it is, it is, it is, it fills my heart. And uh, I'm excited to have Ben here and just his understanding of the depth of Scripture and just uh, to worship along with him. And so it's been a good, good, good morning. And I'm grateful for God's goodness in our lives. Hey, I just want to speak just briefly about our Ash Wednesday service. We are doing it outside. Um, We're going to do it outside. This will, cross your fingers, pray. This will be the last Ash Wednesday service that we'll do outside. But... um, but uh, this is, you know, we want to, one is acknowledge God's goodness. I mean, we always acknowledge God's goodness, that God, no matter the circumstances, no matter the situation, I mean, we could, we could feel like, man, this is, this is a rotten deal. It's a rotten deal. My, my chief's lost. This is a rotten, this is a rotten deal. The 2020 was a rotten deal. But we always affirm God's goodness through it all, that he sustains us that he strengthens us, he teaches us in the midst of it. We learn to depend on him even more in hardships than in good times. And Ash Wednesday, Ash Wednesday is somewhat of a somber service. It is a reminder of our frailty. It's a reminder that we are, in fact, just dust. We are made from dust, that um, the Spirit of God is the thing that brings life to us, that our bodies are mortal. And we start the Lenten season being reminded that really we are dust and eventually these bodies will become dust again, that we live in a, in a world that is passing. And yet we also affirm God's goodness in the fact that he, he, he so loved us, that he chose us and that he died for us. And so Ash Wednesday is a time to kick off the Lenten season. Lent is a, it, it is a time of preparing, preparing for the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and I know that we have had a hard year. And just this week alone, I received probably half a dozen phone calls here at the church of things that would just that brought tears to my eyes. Um, death of loved ones, of uh, people that are going through hardships. And uh, we are tempted as Christians to smile as we should, you know, and we say the joy of the Lord is our strength. And sometimes we downplay sorrow and we downplay tragedy and you know the scriptures especially the old testament there's a whole book that's set aside for lamenting that lamenting is not an evil thing and it's okay to lament pain sorrow last week we talked about jesus weeping when he knew that lazarus was dead and even though he knew that he was about to raise lazarus from the dead he still wept because his heart was moved and death was never a part of God's plan, that death is, 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 is a part of the enemy's move. And so even though Christ has victory over the grave, we still can lament. And so this, this Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, we're going to um, gather together. We're going to remember that we are frail, that we are mortal. And we're also going to give you a chance to remember loved ones that have passed people that you've maybe lost in the last year, um, to consider them. I mean, we don't, we don't pray thinking that our prayers will get them into heaven or anything like that. We, we don't believe that's good theology, but we do remember those that have gone before us. And this will be a chance for those that have lost loved ones to, I know a lot of people that haven't been able to have services, like memorial services, And this is a chance for us just to grieve together and to lament together and to uh, and to be grateful that we have each other and be grateful that we do get to lean on each other and strengthen each other and pray for each other. So please come if you um, are we'll we'll have a chance like where you can go to a table and you can write the named names of loved ones on that table and uh, and even light a candle, not. In a very, just as a reminder that maybe even take that candle back to you. So we're kind of working through all the details, but this will be a chance to kick off the Lenten season 
and, and to grieve as a church together. So come this Wednesday, it'll be at uh, 6 o'clock is when we're going to do it, and it's going to be in this tent, and the service will be short. It'll be about uh, 35 minutes, so we're not going to take up a ton of time. But um, it should be meaningful, and it should be, I, I trust that the Spirit of the Lord will, will use it to comfort us, even as we, we grieve. And, and this whole world <laughs> is, is grieving a loss. And so, so this, this Wednesday is coming up. And uh, so today, today, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and get them out and hold them up. If you brought your Bibles this morning and repeat after me, this is my Bible. It is God's holy word. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And turn to John chapter 21. Give a man a fish and he has food for a day. Teach a man to fish and he has to go out and buy bamboo rods, graphite reels, monofilamite lines, neoprene waders, creels, tackle boxes, lures, flies, splinters, uh, spinners, worm rigs, slip sinkers, offset hooks, Gore-Tex hats, Radars, boats, trailers, global positioning systems, coolers, etc. Hey, uh, maybe you have a fish story. How many of you like to fish? Anyone? Uh, my buddy Chris here, you like to fish. Uh, you catch a big fish, you love to talk about it. How about when you catch no fish? <laughs> Half the time, do you tell your friends you caught no fish? Uh, today, today's story, today is the last of the seven miracles in the book of John. And each miracle has something to teach us. And so this is, uh, now, there are little miracles in the book of John that you can say, well, what about this? But this is a specific clear cut. There's seven miracles that we've worked through. And so today is the last of the seven miracles. And we're going to talk about the significance of this miracle. And so we'll be in John chapter 21. And starting at verse 1, it says, Later. All right, so when you hear the word later, or you hear the word therefore, it's necessary to go and check out what, late, you know, what happened former, what happened previously. And so John, John is wrapping up his book. And John, we call it the book of John, but actually it's a letter written by the Apostle John. And John is, was one of Jesus' closest friends. I mean, he was with Jesus through it all. And he is writing a letter to a group of people um, that he knows probably have not seen the risen Christ. So these are people that uh, they believe in Jesus. They believe that Jesus, um, they, they sense the Holy Spirit upon them. And they are really instrumental. They are the first century Christians. And the first century Christians, I mean, if there's going to be a movement, a movement will be stopped if the very beginning of the movement there isn't this confidence and faith in the purpose of the movement. And so John is writing and he's telling his story, his account of the things that he experienced to a group of people that were not there. They had maybe seen bits and pieces of this. Maybe they'd heard from other stories and other. But this, this is a group of people. There, there is a time where Jesus, um, I think it was with the Doubting Thomas, where Doubting Thomas says, okay, now I touch and I believe and I see. And Jesus says, well, you believe because you see, because you touch. But uh, blessed are those that believe that don't see and don't touch. And John is writing to a group of people that are not going to have the opportunity and the privilege. And we're, we're blessed, church. We're blessed. We have the Bible. We have the Holy Spirit that inspires us. We can gather in the way that the first century church never even thought about gathering in that way. Um, in fact, they would have been persecuted or maybe even put to death. Because So we are blessed in so many ways. Now, I would have loved to put my hand in the scars of Jesus. I would have loved to see him with my very own eyes. I just, oh man, wouldn't that be awesome? And that'd be awesome. And John is writing a group of people that they don't have the privilege that he had to see and to touch. And so he wants to make sure, and he knows that they're getting persecuted for their faith. And he wants to make sure they know that they are following a Christ that, in fact, overcame death in the grave. And so when it says later, 
um, we get a glimpse of what later was about. Later was about, first we see that this is the reason that John wrote. If you look at chapter 20, verse 31, John gives us a glimpse of why he's writing this letter. He's writing this letter and he says, these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. So that's the reason he's writing. And he tells stories in the chapters pre, uh, preceding chapter 21 of all the different appearances that Jesus gave to his disciples, starting with Mary Magdalene at the tomb, and then um, stories of the disciples in the upper room, and how Jesus kind of walked into their presence. And then again, another time with his disciples in the upper room, but this time Thomas was there. Thomas wasn't there before. So he's telling all these accounts and these stories of their eyewitness that they saw Jesus because he knew it was crucial that they believed in the real Christ that was risen from the dead. So he wants to make sure that they know Jesus is, in fact, alive. So later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. Now, Galilee was a crucial place. This is where a lot of the disciples were from. This was close to where Jesus was born in Nazareth. Uh, not born, born in Beth, uh, Bethany, but Bethlehem, excuse me, and, but lived in, in Nazareth, close to the Sea of Galilee. And a lot of Jesus' kind of ministry took place either in Jerusalem, all right, or around the Sea of Galilee. And so this was a crucial place. Spot. This was home for a lot of the disciples. This is not where Jesus rose from the grave. That was close to Jerusalem. This was not where Jesus healed Lazarus. That was close to Jerusalem. And Galilee was way, way up north. So it's a ways away. And now the disciples are there in Galilee, close to where they grew up. And, and actually, where many of them were actually called to follow Jesus. They're the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. John writes, several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter was there. Thomas, also nicknamed the twin. So this would have been doubting Thomas. This was, um, he'd already touched Jesus' side. But there's still, there's question about what does this all mean? Simon Peter was there. Thomas was there. Nathaniel was there from Canaan and Galilee. The sons of Zebedee. All right, so that's John and James. John in his gospel he rarely refers to himself. He always talks about the disciple Jesus loved, or he talks about the sons of Zebedee, also referred to as the sons of thunder, nicknames Jesus gave him them. And then two other disciples. Not sure why they didn't get mentioned, but they didn't get mentioned. Their names didn't get mentioned there. Um, verse 3, Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. Because that's what Simon Peter was. Simon Peter was a fisherman, and that's where he felt comfortable that's where, and as I was thinking about this story, I was thinking about things in my life that brought a great deal of comfort throughout the years, and things that I found my identity in, especially as a young person. And for me as a young person, it was always a uh, sport. It was always basketball. And so if I, had, if I was going through you know, a, a difficult time, if I had to have something that I had to process, I had to, if I was discouraged or if I felt like life just seemed a little out of control, you would find me with a basketball in my hand at a court somewhere shooting hoops. And that's just, that's just kind of how I process thing. and as a, things. As a young man, um, that brought me comfort. That brought me a sense of identity. It, it, it brought me value because it was something that I said, oh, at least I can shoot hoops. You know, if the world is falling apart, if nothing makes sense, if this girl breaks up with me and I feel awful, at least I can go and shoot hoops. And so that's what I would go to. Even, even on, it's funny because even on my uh, honeymoon evening, honeymoon evening, um, I was feeling anxious and I was feeling full of stress. And my wife was stressful, stressed out, and, she was, and I was stressed out, my wife-to-be. And so I just had to get out of the house. And so I just left. I didn't tell anyone that I was leaving. I just left, and I found myself walking around that little town in, in Kansas, Cimarron, Kansas, and, there, and I, I just happened upon a basketball court, and there just happened to be a basketball there. And so for two hours, everyone was driving around looking for me. Like, I had everyone freaked out. They thought I had cold feet. 
I didn't have cold feet. I just needed to process what was going on. And how did I do that? With a basketball in my hand. Does that make sense? Do you all have that kind of thing? Is there anything like that for you? No? That's all right. You, you do. You just are afraid to say something. Um, so that's, that's how I think Simon Peter was dealing with stuff. And Simon, Simon, Pe- Simon Peter, Peter was actually not his name. All right? His name was Simon or Cephas. All right? Or Caiaphas, Cephas? I think it's Cephas. Am I right? But Peter was a nickname. And it was a nickname that was given to him by, by Jesus. And it means, kind of, it kind of means pebble. It kind of means little rock. And, uh, and, and Jesus gave him that name. It, mostly it happened when um, Jesus, when Peter actually tripped upon Jesus' purpose. When Jesus says, who do people say that I am? His disciples said, well, some say you're this prophet or this prophet. And Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? At his disciples. And and Peter goes, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Peter, even though he didn't really figure, he didn't even really know what that meant. He was very confused about what it meant to be the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, yes. He said, on that rock, on that truth that I'm the Messiah, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he called Peter the little rock, the little pebble, because he affirmed that foundation. And so Simon Peter, Simon was a fisherman. That was his identity. Peter was a name given to him by Jesus. And you will no longer, Simon, you will no longer fish for fish, but you will fish for people. You will be a fisherman of people. And so here's Simon, his identity. The world is upside down. He's struggling in life. He's trying to make sense of all that has occurred. It was just um, a couple days before that they marched in Jerusalem, and everyone was saying, Hosanna to glory to God in the highest, and the Messiah is here, and all this stuff. And then it was only like five days afterwards, people are saying, crucify him, crucify him. And he saw his best friend, the very one that changed him from Simon the fisher of fish to Peter the little pebble that would fish for men. His identity, that was his identity, all of a sudden he sees the one that he loves hanging on a tree confusion and so he's like I, got, I don't I don't know what to make of this if he was me he would have gone to a basketball court with the ball but he went to the sea and jumped in his boat and said I'm going fishing we'll come too that's verse three we'll come too they all said so they went out in a boat and they caught all night. Nothing. All night. Now, Peter maybe wanted to get away, but he probably wouldn't have been fishing. I wouldn't have gone to the basketball court if I thought that I was going to make no free throws. He probably assumed he would catch at least something. Now, <laughs> this, is, this is funny because Jesus kind of rubs it in their face. Verse 4, at dawn... Jesus was standing on the beach, but his disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? Come on, Jesus, give the guys a break. No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Amen? Then the disciple Jesus loved, John, said to Peter, It's the Lord. 
And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for the work, jumped into the water. This is, this is typical Peter. And, and they and headed to the shore. He started paddling for the shore. And the others stayed in the boat, and they pulled the loaded nets to shore, for there were only about 100 yards from the shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire, and some bread. Bring some of your fish you've caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore. There was 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him. This is kind of a theme. They knew it was Jesus, but they didn't want... They didn't talk about it. It's like kind of strange. This is not only the, the only time this is mentioned. They, they just kind of knew that it was Jesus, but they didn't want to ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Verse 13, then the Lord served them. Jesus served them the bread and the fish. Broke bread, broke fish. This is the very way that he revealed himself to the, um, the, the, the two on the road to Emmaus. He Uh, broke bread and drank. Some of the things that Jesus did before his death immediately revealed, and as you know, the breaking the fish and the loaves was a great miracle that Megan preached about several weeks ago. And so he did that. This was, it says, this is the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. Now, this is not the third time he revealed himself to people. He revealed himself to Mary and he also the, the two on the road to Emmaus. But this is the third time to a group of disciples that he appeared uh, to them after his resurrection. Let's pray. Thank you so much for this story, Lord. Lord, use this story. Lord, may we hear from you through this story. Speak to our hearts. Transform us. Help us to become more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. This was a significant moment for Peter. This was really a significant moment. This was, uh, I believe, this miracle represented um, when the fog started to lift in his life. Things seemed out of control. Things didn't make sense. Peter had been in a fog for days. And now, this moment. And I'm not sure when Peter realized the significance of who Jesus was and what Jesus came to do. But we know upon Je- in the Garden of Gethsemane, we know Peter was clueless. Him and the other disciples were asleep when they should have been praying. We also know that upon Jesus' arrest, Peter, I used to wonder, how did Peter, I always got the picture of him cutting off the the servant of the high priest's ear by like swinging down. Like how did he cut off his ear and not like cut off his shoulder? But then I was reading a commentary and they said, actually what Peter was probably trying to do is take the servant's head off. And when someone's swinging at you, what do you do? Off, the, off goes the year. And so Peter, even upon Jesus stepping into his mission, Peter didn't get it. He didn't get it uh, when he denied Jesus three times. He didn't get it with the empty tomb. He thought someone stole his body. I mean, time and time again, Peter was, he seemed, he seemed to be a little bit clueless all upon the journey. And And when Jesus tried to tell Peter what was to come, when he said, no, I'm going to die, Peter says, shut your mouth, Jesus. He's trying to talk him out of his mission. So it was really odd. And I got the impression, when you read about Peter, you think that Peter thought that he knew best at just about every turn. And probably Peter thought Jesus, had Jesus just listened to him, things would have turned out better. You ever try to tell the Lord that? (laughs) If you would just do it my way, Jesus. If you would just, you know, make that relationship work or that job work or that, you know, if you just listen to me, Jesus, things would be better. And I think Peter had that kind of an idea. Peter was a fisherman. Peter knew the profession of fishing. 
I think that he would have been shocked that he didn't catch anything all night because the conditions were well ready for the fishing. I wonder, when I was reading this story, when I thought about how silly it was for a seasoned fisherman, like Ben was talking about, a seasoned fisherman to listen to a carpenter for instruction on how to fish, but also how silly it must have seemed to take this big heavy net up out of the water, which had to have been hard work, and take it from the left side and move it to the right side. Like, how big's the boat? Maybe a width of six feet? How could that even matter? How could, when, when it comes to fishing, why would that make any sort of difference? And then when um, the net was filled with fish, I can't help but wonder if Peter made the connection. If the night of fishing with zero to show for it represented his life functioning on his own strength, using his own best judgment, functioning on Peter power. And he realized that nothing would come from Peter power. And I wonder if he made the connection that day with obedience into a fruitful life. We want God to bless us, don't we? God cannot bless things that are done without obedience to him. Why would he? I want God to bless my marriage. Don't you? Your marriage? Are you honoring God? Are you obedient in your marriage? I want God to bless my career. Are you honoring God? Are you being obedient in your career? I want God to bless my family. I would love him to bless my resources. But we have to ask ourselves, are we doing it with Michael Power, trying to function in our own wisdom and our own insight? And I think that that's largely what Peter was doing. And instantly he realized that that will bring you nothing. There's a story in John, uh, and Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he tells them in the context of needing to go away, and he's going to die, and they're, they're brokenhearted, and they're trying to make sense of it. And he said that it's good for me to go away. And he said that those who believe in me will do greater things than I will do. And I can't help but wonder if Peter, for he heard this teaching and he started to realize, yes, I'm going to do greater things, greater things. Peter doing greater things. I'm going to do. And the emphasis was on greater things. And I think Peter probably felt that way because often we think that way. I'm going to do it. Watch out, world. I'm going to do it. And the emphasis isn't on us doing greater things. The emphasis is on those who believe in Christ, those who are obedient to Christ. There's a similar passage in Philippians, Philippians 4.13. It says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Sometimes we take this out of context and we put it on bumper stickers and say, watch out world, here I come, I can do all things. But the emphasis isn't on you doing great things. The emphasis is on in Christ. Without Christ, you'll be fishing all night and you'll be catching nothing. Empty. Shallow, nothing to show for it. And again, obedience, church, obedience doesn't make sense. Oftentimes it doesn't. But <laughs> here's a great quote. Let me give you a quote. It's from Thomas S. Monson. It says, we cannot direct winds, but we can adjust our sails. Meaning that hard times are going to come. Winds are going to blow. Difficult things come. Are you adjusting your sails toward obedience to Christ? These fishing stories bookends Peter's call. At the first, when, when Jesus showed up and he was teaching 
Uh, he was teaching at the same sea, and people were gathering around, and it's found in Luke chapter 5. And Jesus gets in a boat, and they push out a little bit. And Jesus teaches from a boat, probably Peter's boat. This is the first time Peter kind of is interacting with Jesus. And after he's done preaching, Jesus says, let's go out into the deep. And uh, they go out to the deep, and Jesus says to Peter, he says, all right, let down your nets. It's a very similar thing. Peter goes, we've been fishing all night. We haven't caught anything. But because you say so, Lord, we'll do it. And he lets down the nets, and the fish they catch, it takes a whole other boat to come over and bring the fish in. And then on the shore, Peter is broken. He says, away, with, away from me, for I'm a sinful man. And that's when Jesus called and commissioned Peter. That's kind of the bookend. This is one end of Peter's calling. This is the other end of Peter's calling. Booked in. And through the whole thing, through the whole journey, Jesus is trying to get Peter to trust in him. Trust in me. Trust in me. Trust in me. Even if it doesn't make sense. Trust in me. Trust in me. Trust in me. And um, I want to end our time today talking about the good life. The good life is something that we all long for. It is something that we think is out there. If I, just, if I just do whatever, fill in the blank, there's the good life. There's the good life. And, uh, you know, there's a Harvard study I just read. I listened to this on the podcast, and I think it's really fascinating. A new Harvard study that says they've, they've, it was done by psychologists, and they discovered that people that are pursuing circumstances to find joy are less likely to find joy <laughs> And they called it a chasing of shadows in this study. They said the closer you get, the further the shadow feels like it goes away. And so people, uh, I mean, it's our American right, right? Pursuit of happiness. But um, in this account, if you were to ask Peter as a young man, what was the definition of the good life. More than likely, he would have said, a net full of fish. That's what the good life looks like, a net full of fish. Without Jesus, he caught nothing. With Jesus' obedience, he caught a net full of fish. And what I think is so remarkable about the story is once he realized that it was Jesus, he said, forget the fish. (laughs) He plunged in. And he realized the good life was Jesus himself. What's your vision for the good life? We're going to sing a song, Be Thou My Vision. I wanted to read some of the lyrics. It says, be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to, to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence, my light. Riches I heed not. What's, what's the definition? What's your vision for a good life? A, a full net? Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. I was thinking about this. I was, this was probably eight years ago, and I was just going through a hard time at the church. And it just seemed like things were <laughs> really stinky. I, it was a Thursday morning. I had to run a friend of mine up to Fresno to the airport, and we took off early. And I wanted to get back to the church by nine because we did a prayer service in the little prayer chapel back there and I was just like man I need to pray I just need actually you know what I needed I I thought at the time I thought what I need is the encouragement of some of the people that were in the prayer room 
I wanted people that were there to build me up because I was just feeling discouraged. I pull in the church par parking lot. I'm in the back right there. I'm five minutes late. I'm just anxious to get the pats on the back from people. Michael, you showed up for prayer this morning. I go in, and no one was there. And I said, it figures. It figures. It figures. And what I discovered in that prayer room that morning is that I don't need man's empty praise. What I need, I don't need a net full of fish. <laughs> what I need is I need time with my Jesus. What's your vision for the good life? Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only, put first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure, thou art. As we sing this song, if you would like to just come and be prayed over, well, I'll throw a mask on. I'll step down here. If you just, man, it's been, it's been hard. I've been pursuing things. I've, I, I've been looking to fish and catch some fish. It's empty. I just want Jesus. Or maybe you're just, you just need some prayer. Um, Pastor Dave, would you come forward? We'll have a time of prayer. And if you'd like to just be prayed over, you can do that. Otherwise, just affirm in your heart. Today you choose Christ.